Hi, welcome back to the channel. On the CBR 1000RR, you may have seen one of our previous videos where we base run one of these and got a phenomenal stock number. I say we got, the bike made a phenomenal stock number. Today, we're going to go through mapping. So another day, another dyno. Um, it's a little bit warmer in here than out in the workshop, I have to say, but it's still bloody freezing, especially when those uh, fans kick in. So let's see what we're going to be taking a look at. Well, first off, we'll get this bike rigged and we'll show what it takes to actually rig up a bike to enable us to map it. Then we're going to go through the runs, get the bike mapped out, and of course, show you the results along the way. We have worked so closely with Woolwich Racing on these bikes um, in terms of developing what can be done and what can't be done. You know, at the end of the day, it's not us that's been doing it. Obviously, we've just been running the bikes and had bikes to be able to test things on. The real brains of it um, are the guys that are tucked down in Bristol or over in Australia um, at Woolwich Racing themselves, the likes of Richard Bearcroft and obviously Justin Woolwich and whatnot that give us the ability to be able to turn these road bikes into performance track bikes. So without further ado, let's get a look around the bike. So as promised, and I don't think I've done this before, I wanted to show you the setup on the bike, basically just to sort of show what, what we have to do really to get these things mapped. Because I think everyone thinks it goes through these magic doors and poof, thing gets done or just makes a bit of noise. When in reality, I mean, this one's stripped down to doing some other work on it, but for your average road bike, it could be anywhere between maybe 20 minutes up to a good 40 minutes to actually just get to a point where we can map a bike because some ECUs are located under tanks, some ECUs are located in security cages. Yeah, it's a bit of a pain, but looking at this bike, for starters, we've got the ECU under the tank. So if we want an RPM pickup, we have to get the tank cover up, find the wire on the ECU, and that gives us our RPM. If I put the computer on, you'll see there's the tack dial there. And if we were to start the bike, you can see there the RPM registering. And that is basically just telling the dyno what RPM the bike's running at. So we need to get that on. Then we've got all the equipment that you can see here. So first thing is our interface box. This is the little box that allows us to communicate with the ECU. So when it comes to Woolwich Racing, which is our primary ECU flasher, different ECUs use different boxes. So they all look the same, but the internals are different. So for this one, if you can see there, it says K. And that K basically is for K line. Um, so this ECU is a K in ECU, as is Triumph. Yeah, that's probably about it. I'm just trying to think. Realistically, it's Triumphs and Hondas uh, that use um, those ECUs. Then we'll have a, a DCAN, that's for the Denso CAN bus ECUs, uh, one for Ducati. But we've got that there hooked up to the laptop. You can see the Woolwich interface there. On this one here, it goes through a Euro 5 plug. So different cables, different plugs. But that's how we get the comms out of the bike. In actual fact, on these Euro 5 bikes, that's how we also flash the ECU. So tucked out of sight, I've also got a battery tender because again, voltage, voltage is the key. So when we're flashing these, especially if they've got headlights on, some of the early Hondas run the fuel pump, they become very power hungry. And if we see a voltage drop, then we've got the potential for comms to drop out with the ECU and then we're in a whole heap of hurt, to be fair. Although there are recovery options, um, it's, still, it's still a pain in the ass. It's still gonna cost me sort of 40, 45 minutes of time to do that. Then on top of which, we have our AFR data logger as well. So we use two data loggers. One that we can, that will map direct to my Woolwich interface. And when I say map direct, it's a, it's a data gathering tool, it's a logger. So it's nothing's being changed live, it's just telling me what the AFRs were at a given point. And I combine that with the Dyno Lambda. So this exhaust, fortunately, has got three ports on it. So one of the ports, we've got the Dyno Lambda, which measures up here on screen again, we can see that. And that will give us a trace of the AFR against uh, RPM. This will create a chart so that way as well I can compare the two so you know if I see something that I think well, that's a little odd uh, from a logging point of view I can always cross-reference it with the dyno so then I know what basically 
fueling is. Obviously, that's only one element. That's only the fuel tables that we're going to attend to there. When we're mapping these, we have got access to, uh, well, let's have a look. Let's have a look at this one, rather than me guess. So the Honda, because it's quite a new bike, um, there's only been certain maps that have been found for it, but there's still more than enough to do the job here. So looking at this, immediately we've got elements that we can disable within the ECU. So we've got our O2 sensors, top speed, exhaust valve, pair valve and EVAP and the region and various other things. But in the actual map inside of things, the key here, we've got our inlet air pressure fuel maps and our TPS maps. We've spoken about those before, our ignition maps. And realistically, that's all you need. We've got throttle maps tucked away in there. So looking at fuel maps, ignition maps, throttle maps, sensor deletes, you've got the makings to map a bike. You know, other bikes, I don't know, the Yamaha R1, we've got access to, oh wow, God, the list is like this. All the various traction control settings, all the anti-wheelie settings, engine braking, you name it. So every bike differs. But ultimately, this will log to that and it will give us our AFR value that we can then utilize to change the fuel map. And that's really about it. So you can imagine, it takes about, I don't know, half hour, 40 minutes on some bikes to rig them, then we've got to de-rig them. So part of the process is spending anywhere up to an hour just prepping the bike, getting it ready for mapping. And when the door's shut, you guys out there don't see that. So I thought while I'm doing this bike, I'll give you a little insight onto that. But I'm gonna crack back on now. We're about halfway through mapping this one. Um, so when it did its original base runs, I believe this one came in at 200. And with the exhaust, we've seen it at 206. And looking at those numbers, I'm expecting to see around 212, 213 uh, at the rear wheel once it's mapped. But I'm about, like I say, 50% through. Got a few more runs to do just to make sure that the, the mapping is where it needs to be. is quite frankly that during these sessions sometimes time literally runs away with us it's really hard to be in a position to map these bikes and do the videos so we got that bike all mapped up and we had a staggering result well I think it is I think I can't believe a production road bike without any engine tuning can make that sort of power but following this you'll see the dyno chart and the bike ended up making, I believe it was 214. So I do believe that's because I can't quite remember. Um, I'll be downloading that tomorrow and putting it on the end of this video for you guys to look at, but pretty sure it's 214. So we're looking at a bike that sort of started around the 200, 200 and bit mark, ended up around the 206, 207 mark uh, with the exhaust, and then complete with mapping, we end up around the 213. Now, since doing this video as well, we have done a few more fire blades and we see that the average bog stock starting point is around 200 to 204. And we've seen basically power go uh, 210. Uh, we've had one at 211. And that only had, only had a acrobic can and the track day link pipe. Um, we've also seen them at 214, 215. That's with the full acroprovic system. So it does depend sometimes, and also on the running. So a few of those higher numbered bikes, we've done the running in uh, as prescribed by the HRC manual. Uh, maybe that helps, um, who knows? Um, I'd like to think it does. We have also developed our own DCAT system for these as well. So if you are a regular viewer, uh, take a look at our channel 
subscribe, hit the bell icon, because I'm sure there's gonna be an advert hitting that soon, advertising that exhaust. And what's really interesting about that is the massive mid-range gains it gives you if you're just using a link pipe and can uh, over doing the, the decap. So anyway, let's get a little look at that dyno chart and you'll see us sort of through the ages for it. And that's the Honda CBR1000 RRR SP uh, 2024. It took a lot of work to get that bike where it is now. And after spending, well, considerable days to be fair, I think we were at it just doing R&D for four days uh, with Woolwich. Um, we got a bike that went out, raced at Donington Park, and one, simple as that, uh, customer's first time on the machine. So they are highly capable, and what you can do to them to turn them into a right performance machine is also. So once again, thanks for taking the time to uh, watch this video. Have a look at the dyno chart, and if you've got any questions, pop them in the comment section. And of course, if you're looking to get your Fireblade or any other bike uh, mapped or worked on, give us a shout.